Okay, well, um, we're still um, anticipating some arrivals, but I think we'll get going and uh, see if I could start as I am normally want uh, with a retrospective, um, in this case, back on, on Wednesday, yesterday. Um, so uh, in yesterday's uh, sessions, um, I covered uh, grab bag material. Um, much of my goal yesterday was to communicate the major elements of the modeling toolbox uh, to you. One was uh, to talk about uh, the use of networks with messages, where messages are these sort of quantized, these individual packets of, of uh, effects from one agent to another, or from the environment to agents. Um, they represent some sort of quantized causal impact that one party is having on another. Uh, be it the overall global environment on a person or, or say person to person or otherwise person or agent to agent. And uh, these bits of sort of causal impact that are, that are tied up with one of these messages vary hugely from model to model. Sometimes they communicate pathogen and that's what we saw yesterday. So, so one person exposed another person passage. In other cases, it communicates information of some sort. It may communicate some sort of potential for, for demonstrating some behavior that could be imitated by the, by the recipient. Maybe I smoke and I send messages to my neighbors in the network that might influence them to start smoking. Um, or, or similar with substance use, right? Um, there might be bits of, of information um, involved in knowledge sharing, attitudes, beliefs, subscription to some weird conspiracy theory that that might be communicated with this these sort of messages. These messages travel over networks. They go from one agent to another, commonly across a network connection. So one agent exposes other agents to this message. And we saw this yesterday uh, in the model that we were building up together. Um, and if I were to go call up uh, that model here uh, and remind you of it. Um, I'll go share my screen. We had in here, uh, agents were all people in this particular model. And there was this place where infective agents sent to other agents to whom they were connected in the network, a message saying you're exposed to infection that my neighbors are exposed to infection. This is sending to one of their neighbors, randomly chosen with uniform probability from among their neighbors, and it's saying they're exposed. And uh, if one of those neighbors were susceptible, they'd receive this message and could thereby get infected. Now, uh, in this case, infection was a certitude. If someone was susceptible and they received this message, they do become infective. But we also saw in the same model, one of my sub goals was to introduce you to these branching constructs, which are available in the palette uh, as a branch. And this allows us to have a conditional occurrence. So it allows us to say, this thing may happen or that thing may happen, or one of a set of things. We, we saw how it was used when people came in to divide them between susceptible and infective. 
But if we had wanted infection of a person to, to occur with a, only with a certain probability, we could have created a branch here, which would have given this person a certain chance of going on uh, and a certain chance of remaining susceptible, something along those lines. Uh, and only one of these would have been the default, the other would have been conditional, and we could have had something like random, true, main dot, um, you know, transmission probability or something like that, where each person confers a certain probability of infection to a neighbor when they expose them to the pathogen. So if I'm infected, and I expose my neighbor to pathogen, they don't get it for sure, they get it with a certain probability. Any thoughts on things that might affect that probability a neighbor might get infected? Where could that be useful? Vaccination would be an excellent one. Anything else? Age. Age would be another one. Anything else? Mask wearing. Mask wearing. <laughs> uh, and, and mask wearing is particularly interesting, isn't it? Because the person, if the person exposed is wearing a mask, right, um, they might have a lower chance of getting infected. Um, but if the person exposing them is wearing a mask, it might also lower risk of transmission. And so quite interesting studies have been done with sort of fluid dynamics experiments with, with actual people to observe the effectiveness of the mask. And there are those two complementary um, impacts um, and they, they operate somewhat differently. Um, so all of those might, might affect this risk of transmission. There might be environmental factors as well, right? The, um, I'm told that the flu virus survives better in dry cold. It actually lasts longer as a kind of as a as a quantity that can infect people. Um, and and that might also affect the probability that someone is is uh, receives um, uh, infection. So you know if we wanted to take this model a step further and incorporate probabilistic transmission, we that would open up for us by having done so it would open up for us a possibility of characterizing certain types of interventions so sometimes putting mechanisms into your model putting new little bits of of, of kind of logic and uh yeah little bits of logic can open up for you the possibility that you can start to, to simulate new types of interventions. To capture bidirectional masking, we need a little bit more mechanism yet. But um, uh, this state chart um, is emblematic of what you see with, with uh, these sort of messages that often we will use them to relay influence of one person or another, and sometimes it's probabilistic influence. We also yesterday, although we didn't have time to pursue it in as general manner as we could have, um, very quickly before lunch in a somewhat only limited success in getting you to lunch before the football players, we introduced uh, this construct for dividing people up initially among these two states. And uh, there's a more elegant way to do that that would divide them up between all of the states and allow us to pick in what state a person is, is placed, um, in what state uh, a person starts in this model. Um, and uh, if people were interested, I'd be glad to showcase that. It's probably a, probably a good thing to, uh, to show here. Um, and uh, I may do that pursuant to interest uh, after um, after my I make my comments here. 
Um, so yesterday I introduced messages as a key mechanism for transmission from one person to another and, uh, and or from one agent to another from the environment to the agent. And indeed, um, while that first model we used networks with peer pressure effects that were based on you know the fraction of my of my connections that were smokers, uh, doing exploring this with messages is more common. And commonly within a given model, we'll have several types of messages spreading. So there might be messages associated with um, uh, a, a person's uh, exposure to pathogen. There might be other messages associated with a medical procedure or, or um, uh, administration applied to a person. Maybe it's a vaccination. So a doctor might send a patient a message that says you are now vaccinated with Pfizer, um, et cetera. Um, there might be some messages associated with spread of, of uh, ideation, um, you know, of ideas uh, toward, you know, positive or negative towards vaccines or what have you. You might have in, in a model many types of messages. And I think I will come back to that point after the retrospective to show how to accomplish that and dividing people up into states uh, together. So that was kind of messages. It's the primary way we communicate between agents in, in these models. Um, that was one major goal for yesterday to introduce you to that. And, and using that basic construct of agents in networks, we built up uh, this network, which involved disparities. What was the disparity captured? What was the key disparity captured in that network yesterday? What, what aspect of the situation imposed disproportionate risk on certain individuals more than others? Crowding. Crowding, yeah. Crowding as induced by low SES income, right? So we had yesterday this network that was disproportionately dense for people who were lower income individuals and for higher income individuals that involved lower density in, in their packing. So here are lower income individuals and over here are, are uh, individuals at successively higher levels of income. Uh, and we saw that that disparity that we introduced, we layered in here um, as it affected the network, then ended up uh, affecting in turn some of the outcomes, the emergent outcomes we saw among Low-income individuals, there was a much higher burden of infection in terms of number of times they were infected compared to medium and high-income individuals, who, it, who included about 40% of their number with no infection at all. That's that sort of uh, uh, second peak over here, the second mode. This was a bimodal distribution, whereas this was unimodal. And, and pretty well centered around, around uh, about 175 infections over the uh, uh, 70, 7,300 um, time units, uh, days of them all. Now, um, this model gave also uh, a, a vivid demonstration of the association between income, for a slice of the income here, and number of times infected, which suggested the larger their income, by and large, there was a lower burden of infection. Uh, in, uh, the, the, particularly for very low incomes, you had very high level, um, you had a large number of individuals, each individual is a dot here, and they were clustered at low income, high number of infections. But as you got successively larger, it, it brought down those number of infections cumulatively experienced by those individuals. 
But the graph is not without its quirks. Uh, here, for example, we see at 3000, a little blip probably associated with some sort of connected component of higher income individuals. But the overall picture here, the overall relationship is likely a fairly stable one for, um, uh, for the, uh, the the particular model assumptions in the form of model structure and the form of parameters. If we were to run this model again, um, note that it disappears around 2000, note that there's a blip around 2700. Um, I'm guessing that later blip um, of, of sort of uh, medium income individuals who have disproportionately high infection there is probably an artifact of that particular uh, happenstance, that particular set of stochastics um, and initial randomness in network structure. But we're probably seeing here also a, um, uh, a, a, a you know, regularity, a structural regularity below 2000. That's pretty regular. Yeah. And so we don't see the this blip around here. Instead, we see a, a little bit of a component here. Mind you, I'm running this version six, which I had modified to have only 0.5 probability. So um, by um, by all justice, I should uh, provide that to you here in case anyone wants to, to uh, uh, use that as well. So here it is. This is the, oh, this is the latest model uh, that as I modified it this morning, just now. Okay. so. We see patterns, associations induced by this data generating process. This, this dynamic process underlying the model induces these patterns, these associations. And I argued that those associations, while they might be fairly regular, fairly stable, many of them for this model with these assumptions, we noted that if we modified model assumptions. If we intervened, for example, we might see a very different uh, path that emerged. And um, to that end, it brought us to the other main goal, excuse me, of the day, which was to show how to capture some scenarios that represented what if questions, represented intervention. Not all what if questions and dynamic modeling and agent based modeling by extension are concern interventions or policies or program design, um, but it's an important subclass. And in this case, we were looking at interventions that, that were particularly simplistic in their depiction um, or, or in their in in what they um what they assumed here um so we we posited that we could lower for example the contact rate uh or lower so the contact rate maybe through social distancing orders or encouraging people to work from home or encouraging people to to avoid gatherings that sort of thing or we we examine the impact of more aggressive contact tracing and finding people who are infected or what have you, going and, and screening more effectively. I think drive-through screenings that might lower the time that they spend infected circulating. So we lower the duration of infection, right? Um, and uh, each of those uh, had some effect and then we combined them and there was a combined effect. And uh, each of those contributed to lowering the burden of infection. And when we combined them, there was a further lowering yet. And if we examine this, we will often find that the effects are not additive. So if we intervene in a way that helps A, and we intervene in another way, say lower contact rate, another way that helps, say lowering duration of infection, B, the gains from each of them we consider the gains from each of them in isolation, and we sum those up. That might be quite different from the gains of combining. It might be they work together synergistically, or it might be they work at cross purposes. Um, 
but uh, we will often find that they they don't they don't scale any of it. You, you don't simply gain the sum of those benefits like money. Um, they might uh, not be highly complementary. Um, so we saw that yesterday, and you know, based on the little the little modification I made. Um, representing the probability of transmission, we could add another component of that here. Those are all very simple scenarios. And, and yet they point to a basic feature that you see in a lot of dynamic models um, that at a, at a basic level, interventions are commonly realized, effectuated, made possible by changing parameter values. What the parameters represent will be different per model, but commonly we change parameters to change assumptions to say, let's simulate the effect of this intervention. So we might, um, those, in addition to those two interventions, have a masking intervention where we lower this probability of transmission given exposure, for example. Um, now, I felt um, somewhat dissatisfied with having to leave the discussion there because one of the things that really dis distinguishes agent-based modeling is its remarkable capacity, remarkably rich capacity to characterize textured interventions and implementation of interventions. Some of you um, may be familiar with the distinction, others maybe less so. I'd like to comment a little bit about the distinction. So when we're talking about interventions here, um, uh, we use in modeling that term in a way that um, is a little bit, in my mind, uh, unfortunate because it it's a little bit broader than maybe what my health science colleagues will often use, where they'll distinguish between a policy um, and a more targeted uh, intervention, uh, whereas they're often kind of clumped together in modeling speak. But um, within these models, uh, we can readily represent more changes of policy, kind of the guidelines, the rules, the, the rules that are in place uh, within the model for governing, say, how um, contact tracing is going to be organized or governing how uh, screening is going to be you know, instituted across the province, um, how public health orders will be declared in response to outbreaks or, or how information will be shared. We could actually represent that within a model. Um, and we can also, in these models, represent targeted interventions that reflects the fact we're characterizing people at a very individual at an individual level. And by virtue of that, we can target interventions based on a person's characteristics. We could have interventions that are focused on individuals who have presented for care three or more times with SDIs, on the SDI clinic three or more times. Or we could target individuals who are at, in the core areas of their network or a certain number of network connections. We could target individuals who are of a certain age category or of a certain number of comorbid conditions. We can capture all of this in age-based modeling because of the ability to capture heterogeneity that's both static the characteristics of a person that may leave them vulnerable and dynamic things like having multiple comorbid conditions, um, things like um, perhaps uh, chronic kidney disease or being having a transplant, um, perhaps being in a situation where you have uh, severe, um, a severe COPD, something that might expose you as well to, to respiratory distress. So, so in models like this, we can capture that sort of information and we can target interventions uh, accordingly. Very powerful 
we can target interventions dynamically when a person develops a certain history of care seeking you know they're going to the sti clinic frequently we can um we can Im implement uh behavioral counseling for them or motivational interviewing for them in a way that will maybe effectuate changes in behavior. Now, beyond that, we can in these models, although I won't run a session on it right now, I'm glad to do so if there were interests, examine intervention implementation factors. We can actually simulate how an intervention is rolled out how it's it's realized um and at least one of the models i provided to you has that sort of implement intervention implementation focus it has um implementation science elements um as indicated by its name and this is often not a level of analysis which is tradition, it's, it's not a traditional level of analysis with, with most models. It's um, only newer generations of models that are really fully tapping this. We, we did our first foray into this uh, 25 years ago, but it's been comparatively less represented in the literature. Implementation science investigations with models. And when I'm talking about implementation science there, I'm talking about factors, for those not familiar with the term crudely, that have to do with scale up of an implementation of, a, of, a, of an intervention that have to do with making it self-sustaining, sustainable financially, for example, with scaling up the number of um, human resources that are required, training, training people to undertake that intervention or training the trainers, simulating the dynamics of rolling out the implementation on the ground. Maybe it's training ICU nurses for deployment to the ICU, or maybe it's training contact tracing teams, representing the dynamics of rolling out the intervention, of scaling it up, of adapting it to a new context, making it sustainable, making it uh, financially um, self-sustaining or what have you. Um, scaling it up uh, at a province level. Um, this is this is uh, an important need in practice involving uh, many areas of health. We have we have a need to implement the interventions, and uh, those sort of factors are things we can examine with uh, with these sorts of models. We can simulate agents or trainers and have them go through a training process, which builds their skills to then get into, as a stage of their world, um, the vaccination delivery or what have you, and you can deliver that in the model. So models like this do often represent, we saw, yes, interventions at a very stylized level. So we lower this parameter, we change that, but sometimes they go into much more detail. They can go into more detail about how we implement the intervention, where the implementation of the intervention is endogenous, to use a term you should now recognize, where the model is stimulating how the intervention is being rolled out, how quickly or how slowly, how effectively, and that ends up affecting the delivery of vaccines or the ability to bring people in quickly for diagnosis and contact tracing, which will mean they're in fact circulating infective less long. So I want to distinguish that that level of, 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 of capturing of interventions. This is rarely talked about. I'm not sure I've ever seen a fulsome discussion of this in the literature, but models like this, in addition to very high level depiction of implementations, uh, of, of interventions can depict the implementation dynamics. And to do so is not hard. It just takes a different mindset and it takes on the ground understanding of what it takes to deliver this intervention, what it takes to roll it out. But it's often a big concern at a practical level. How quickly can we roll this out? How effective will it be? How many trainers do we need? And you can simulate 
different possible configurations of the implementation. You know, how many trainers do we need to train the trainers? And, you know, how, how long will it take to roll that out? And how soon could we expect to see effects that actually um, getting large numbers of patients, you know, being caught earlier or what have you, you can capture those factors within the dynamics, the endogenous dynamics of the model. And that's a powerful asset for certain types of inquiry. It's a, it's a practical concern when it comes to how soon will we see effect of, a, of an intervention. And I, I'll highlight that last one, this point about time to effect as something that these models um, have as a, uh, as a uh, real asset, the, the ability to examine. Um, often, we are interested in understanding the impacts of an intervention vis-a-vis -vis some baseline. And we'll say, this intervention lowered the number of deaths by X. But another component of it that is often examined as, as well is how quickly is it going to have an impact? There is a graveyard of interventions that if were judged prematurely to be ineffectual, to be judged prematurely, they were prejudged to be ineffective because people didn't wait long enough to evaluate them. They, they, they judge them before their natural time to show effect. Models like this can be used to understand how long do we have to wait until we expect to see effects from changes. Um, sometimes it may be days, sometimes it may be weeks. In other cases, maybe with adverse childhood experiences, with, with impacts on trauma, trauma-informed care, we may have to wait a decade or more you know, to start to see effects. But models like this can give you, because they anticipate changes over time, some sense of how long do we have to, do we have to wait to see those effects? And that can be important for setting expectations of funders, of policymakers who will commit to an intervention you know, we're not going to see results tomorrow. We're not going to see results in the next month. Maybe six months from now, we could start to see results. But hold your horses. Don't declare this dead and, and ineffectual before it's natural time to show effect. It may take a year to show effect, so let's not prejudge it. Let's not declare it useless because we don't see effects in the next quarter. That's a an important practical consideration. And, you know, it's tied up in some cases with the need to implement it. So um, if anyone pokes around the list of example models, you'll find um, a model involving implementation science features. And I'm glad to showcase it if uh, that were interest uh, in the next, uh, you know, today or tomorrow. Okay. Um, those were some of the major um, topics that we hit yesterday. Are there any things people would like to, well, I, I guess I'll say one other thing that since we're talking about the broad sweep of things. So yesterday, uh, those physically present also went through the incubator projects um, and we're very lucky to have Tony here joining us today. Um, uh, who also has great experience with any logic and hopefully will be able to join one of those uh, incubator project teams um, that are being worked on. I'm really excited to see those teams developing. Um, I'm in the unique position of, of circulating uh, variously between the different teams, um, the hospital and community care, getting a glimpse of what's going on there. Uh, the work with uh, reuse of foods, reducing waste, and, and feeding um, and feeding individuals in need, and the syphilis, uh, um, and, and discussing modeling of the syphilis context uh, within the province. And I'm quite pleased to see those um, moving forward. I, I think there's lots of good discussion with building foundational understanding taking place. 
and I'm seeing moves towards some model structure across all the teams. Um, uh, I'm hoping today we can see more of that, a lot more. And I wanna make sure a lot of this afternoon is reserved for that, okay? Um, stakeholders, um, the SHA team, Wanda, Saab, if at any point you want to grab your TAs you've been working with and go off and work with them, if the materials today don't speak with you, don't speak to you um, in one session or another, feel free to do that. Okay. So please, please recognize that we rec we we see the advancement of the incubator projects as a key priority. And if you feel that that would be the best route to learning for the next little bit, or you want to get the model over a hump, or you want to get structure in place, please be empowered to do that. And I will be delighted by that and um, keen to see um, keen to see some of the outcomes from that extra push. Great. Um, okay. Any questions, comments, um, concerns, uh, needs uh, that have come up today? or over the past day that you'd like to bring to the floor or anything else you want to talk about. I wonder if we could just do a quick uh, review around the network structure, sure. how how we determine that network structure for the infection. Great. Is Great. it the contact? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to address this at two levels. Um, one level is more superficial and one level is more substantive. Um, so um, in, in, in as much as review, yesterday we we saw that um, as as Monday uh, or Tuesday, we, we saw also that we um, could impose a certain network type on the model. Um, and in this case, we, we used one of the five or so built-in networks. Um, uh, and, and we said, okay, we're positing transmission of infection, which is based on physical contact, physical proximity, or at least requires it, uh, whether it's STIs, whether it's sexual contact or needle sharing contact or aerosols or moisture droplets or what have you. It's probably has some member of proximity. So we used a distance-based network and we connected people over a certain distance apart. Um, so that was how we, at a, at a kind of superficial level, mechanical level, we told any logic, hey, you know, use a distance-based network and we had artfully arranged this such that the uh, people's location was dictated by their income. Um, and that meant that uh, individuals who were lower income um, uh, were over the left and, and higher income right. And more than that, we drew it from a log normal distribution. So we had, you know, uh, a hump of people with lower income, thank you, and uh, and then a smaller number for the drop, and so there was a disproportionate crowding and low income. Um, that that that's kind of how we impose it here. But what I thought I heard from you, Wanda, was a broader question on like how do we in in, in practice how can we determine network structure? Like if we, if we were if we were operating the world. What we use to inform network structure, and this is an extremely interesting uh, question, which we have worked on over different points in my career to good effect. And and I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to comment on it, trying not to speak for too long about it, but telling you a number of ways we can we can identify network structure. Um, so there are cases where we are dealing with um, conditions that are, are so physically based that people's domiciles, their places of, of home and work um, um, are, are 
provide good guidance for for connectivity patterns, say to the neighbors. And we might recognize they're mobile individuals, but at any given time, people tend to be connected to people at nearby geographical proximity. Um, and so there are times where we'll use a distance-based network to capture the fact that, you know, I run into people nearby me more frequently. And uh, we will use that perhaps with the distance threshold that is based on some sort of uh, uh, reflection of, of people's uh, circulation patterns. Um, so some of the models that Wade has worked on with pertussis or chickenpox, for example, um, will have, you know, like kids in a school connected tightly with other kids in the school. To remind me, for that chickenpox maternal immunization, there weren't classrooms there, right? It was just school, just schools as, as a monolithic. As a monolithic thing. So they were connected with other kids in that school with equal probability. Yes. Yeah. Um, and other models, you might have kids connected with others in their classroom, you know, at their same class level, and uh, only loosely so with, uh, with individuals uh, who are. Uh, who are younger or different different age. Um, uh, now beyond this, um, we uh, will often have uh, from that um, some relationship of like homes and schools that they go to, and so there'll be a a network of sort. It may not be represented visually, but a network, you know, homes. Are affiliated with a nearby school because kids go to that go to that school and therefore they circulate with others in the home. They circulate with others in the school to which they jointly attend with other kids and um, and we sort of impose a network structure based on that circulation. Um, there might be similarly workplace um, contact between individuals. So often it is based on institutions and it's not one of these five types. There are times where we actually have data on network structure. And so Mark Brisson and uh, uh, Melanie uh, Drolet, I think in Quebec, um, have done some wonderful work in adapting a um, Polymon uh, study, which is conducted worldwide on network patterns to Canada, and they systematically inquire with people as to their contacts uh, day to day, who do they spend time with, with whom do they spend time, and they built up quantitative information of, of, of some depth on Canadians' patterns of mixing with people of different sorts in their networks. And we will often try to use that information and be true to it in our models. So assume um, network structure for models that it will stay true to that polymod data. And in this um, maternal immunization work that Wade worked on, um, had polymon data as something they look to to kind of validate the network assumption that were were based on where where people circulated. There are also times where data exists uh, from social network analysis. There's this whole field of social network analysis, and we've we've made some contributions that there's a there's a, um, a famous uh, conference associated with that. And, I think um, Sunbelt and uh, a set of other forums for for social network analysis. And this is very common in certain areas. Uh, as Sam is aware, contact tracing is a key part of infection control for diseases like TB, um, you know, com uh, reportable communicable diseases or notifiable communicable diseases. So TB and gonorrhea and, and, and chlamydia um, syphilis and uh, a variety of others. Um, and their contact tracing goes on and networks are created from contact traces 
that are analyzed by this community. So there's actually um, some quite good uh, information that's been built up empirically on, on network structure for certain types of illnesses. Um, and I can't remember if I have um, too many graphs of this. This is TB network structure for the province as it was in, this is for Saskatchewan. Um, uh, we, we did some analysis and this is from about 10 years ago, hundreds of work with the TB control program. And these are networks as identified via contact tracing for different communities in the province. Uh, so these, these blobs are of different colors, are different communities which individuals lived. And you can see some individual bridge these different communities. Um, and here we have to remember that this network structure that we're capturing through contact tracing is not, and this is important, it's not the actual underlying network. It is the network as traced by contact tracing, as because contact tracing for TV at the time, it's a rule. You know, they ask people, who did you spend time? Who did you spend at least 10 hours with over the past month? Um, and uh, different priority was attached to uh, to children with TV. Uh, and and basically that determines as an endogenous. Um, emergent property in these contact tracing networks, and you're trying to match your model network assumptions with what comes out of this contact tracing. You have to stimulate contact tracing in your model, and you generate a network, and you compare it against the structure, what you observe in the curve. Now, we've also made heavy use in my group over the years in probably a dozen or so studies of collecting contact a, a contact pattern data using smartphones from consenting individuals. And here we actually capture contacts between individuals that can be as short as you know, a couple minutes to as long as hours. And uh, this has varied from contact patterns between, uh, between students on campus, all this is with consent, of course, um, uh, contact patterns uh, from uh, veterans to their service dogs, how much time and under what conditions they're spending together and how does that relate to their ideation? How does it relate to their um, uh, their uh, self-medication, et cetera? Um, we've also looked at um, patterns of contact between multidisciplinary teams of physicians within RUH, et cetera. And that yields more direct contact data. It's it, it more direct network data. Um, and we get dynamic networks out of it. And um, we have many published papers on the structure of those networks and um, and what they look like. Uh, this from, um, yeah, uh, I'll, uh, uh, so, so that's another source of information. In certain areas, um, people have done a lot of work um, with uh, networks, uh, STIs are, are one of them and have identified patterns in, say, the number of partners uh, individuals have, these are sexual partners here, uh, against frequency. And these charts, um, these graphs, uh, show the sort of comparatively long tail that can be associated with, with sexual partner, numbers of sexual partners on the XX and their, their relative frequency, which turns out to reveal network structure that's emblematic of what's called a um, scale-free network. Um, and scale-free networks were first really extensively described by, um, and I have the, the reference here, Albert Jong and Barabazi in Nature in about 20, 25 years ago, 23 years ago. And these are actually very common. They keep on recurring in human created systems, engineered system, natural systems, and human networks, what are called scale free networks. And these have this scale free property that no matter how big my number of connections is, if I compare the probability of having that number of connections with twice that number of connections, that ratio is, is always the same. And 
it turns out that if you empirically collect data on on number of partners, number of sexual partners, you'll see that it observes one of these power laws. You'll see that that if you plot it on a log log plot here, number of sexual partners here, the frequency here, and these are both log axes, it's a straight line. And that indicates a scale-free relationship. It indicates a power law relationship between the two. And what that means is we can approximate it very well using what's called a scale-free network. And indeed, in any logic, um, a few of these types of networks, distance-based, scale-free, another type called small world, which has also been very popularized by um, uh, Strogatz and Watts um, and some of their work are captured. So um, Wanda, you can find from certain types of data kind of the signatures that, aha, this is a scale-free network. If you look at this data and you were to plot out in a log log, you'd say, oh, okay, it's a scale-free network. I will use a scale-free network with the necessary parameters to match up this relationship here. And you can, in uh, in the software, you know, basically examine the implications. What if this network was scale-free versus what's called a small world network versus a distance-based network? How would it affect infection transmission or transmission of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and innovation? Um, so another way, we have this data, we recognize the patterns of one of these types of networks, and we impose that network and use it as part of our model. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it turns out, like, collecting data on network structures, by and large, becoming a lot easier. So um, we, have, so we have lighter weight ways to doing it and more data coming in with the, the big data recognition. So um, I believe that's helpful. Uh, Great question. Other questions? Questions from the remote uh, group? I'm glad to answer them. Anyone? Anyone in the remote group there? Okay, I'm not hearing any needs there. Um, should we take five minute break and reconvene at half past and get going? Does that sound good? Um, oh, I should comment just uh, one moment on today. Um, so today we're going to have uh, three major components of the work that I'm anticipating. One, I want to introduce you to um, geographic and spatial models including mobility, movement of people between different venues. And as I walked up the stairs this morning, the thought struck me of a neat model to build. Um, and so we're, we're going to try it out, OK? Um, you're not the guinea pigs. You're the, you're the early adopters. Um, uh, but, but it will showcase some neat features that um, I've never had a chance to, to combine in a model uh, quite this way. Um, so that's that's one thing. We're going to be exploring models of mobility and uh, mobility over space um, in between institutions. Second of all, we'll go into geographic data a bit, okay, um, and talk about incorporation of uh, geographical information. You may have heard of GIS data, geographical information systems data, and that like network data. That, like much biostatistical data, can work hand in glove with these sort of models if you know how to put them together. And um, it turns out any logic in particular has a really rich ability to tap into geographic information systems. Wade, um, Wade talked about one model that made use of this data earlier um, uh, for uh, the uh, yellow quill impersonation. Um, but uh, we're going to be briefly looking at that. And then this afternoon, there's going to be another model that came out of last year's boot camp, no less, but was developed further for the hackathon. And it's been developed since then on uh, uh, an area 
of which I was rather innocent until this project, um, trucker health. Health of truckers, long distance truckers. Um, and you'll hear about a geographically explicit model of trucker health where the model keeps on trucking. It keeps on, it, so trucks move through various states. And this is in the US. Um, and drivers are exposed to various uh, environments uh, of uh, offering offering a diversity of, of, of level of uh, accessibility of healthy options. Um, some of the trucker stops are not purely health foods. Um, and it also impacts health through long hours, fatigue, um, social isolation potentially, and lack of access to exercise, and hard to exercise when driving. Um, so, You'll hear about that model of trucker health. And we'll we'll use most of the afternoon. I think we'll probably break after that and use most of the afternoon for the incubator projects. Okay, to, to advance the program. So that's for today. Let's take a break for five minutes and we'll reconvene here and get going with some of the mobility modeling. Great. Thank you. So back in five minutes.